Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I, I guess Edinburgh is challenging Chicago at the moment for Windy City. I have a, 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 a basically a following of um, big storms because I've managed to. Uh, not only was I in New York for Hurricane Sandy, I then was actually in Hong Kong for Typhoon Hatto, and now I'm here for, I think, is what, Storm Hector. So uh, uh, it's something that I'm actually now, if anybody needs any advice of what to do in a storm, just let me, just come and see me later. Um, my job is really to scene set, to give you some background in terms of what we see going on in the market. And I guess, in some respects, in my new role, I have got a broader view because we are an advisory business, we're also a developer, uh, we are also an asset manager, um, and we are also a bank, uh, and we are also very interested in natural capital. Um, corporate sustainable, uh, sustainable and responsibility is something that somebody that employs 185,000 people is actually quite interested in, so uh, it's going to be quite an interesting day. What I wanted to do is really start with where we are. So let's get the bad news out the way first. We are in a market where maybe confidence is a little bit uh, in question. Um, all of these good years that we've had, actually what's going to happen next? And whilst I can't uh, predict the future, what I wanted to do is provide some guidance into a thought process. And what I wanted just to remind you is that markets are cyclical. You know, basically everything that we see and we do is actually we're involved in cycles. And if you look at those cycles, the ones that we don't like are the ones at the end of the 80s. We don't, certainly don't like the ones uh, that happened in the middle of the noughties. Uh, but all the way through, we have been managing <coughs> ourselves through cycles. And the question is, where are we at the moment? But you can see the cycle we're in at the moment is not necessarily a deep cycle where we've got major rises, very quick rises and very small falls. So in other words, what's going to happen next? And I'll try and give you some indicators. Let me just go back to the place of property. Property has performed a lot better than most people thought it would do. Uh, in fact, actually, it's performed in such a way that uh, it is now more attractive to investing institutions and perhaps we we were at the beginning of the cycle. This year, it's the only number which is in the positive. Not much, maybe, but it is nonetheless an important asset class. The reason is because of this, income. Now, all the other figures are important. The fact that it got up to 10% nearly last year, great, but the thing that people are following is income. And so the question is, what sort of income is attractive at the moment? And you can see there that the risk premia over 10-year gilts is actually quite attractive. And so this is the thing that when you start looking at confidence in the markets, you've got to look at actually what is it that investors are chasing after. And it is income. And I'll explain a bit why as we get into this. If we look at performance, that you can see there that generally it's been a mixed bag. But the sorts of figures that you see is actually all of them are performing at reasonable levels. The only one, Ben, I'm sure will cover it is shopping centres, perhaps going through a transformational change. Um, but if you look at what's been holding this up right at the bottom, industrial. And that may be something that we pick up on, that actually industrial, is it industrial, is it logistics, is it basically e-retailing, is it, if you like, last mile solutions and things like that. Undoubtedly, the index has been held up a lot by what's happened in the industrial market. If we go to Scotland, you'll see the performance is not following the rest of the market. And in particular, if you look at what happened on industrial, you're not seeing that kick in Scotland yet in terms of the industrial market. But if you look at the income returns, and just remember this is income is important, and you'll, you'll get the reason for the flavour of this later, Scotland is producing decent income, and that's going to be important for the next phase of the market. And if you look at returns, you know, Glasgow and Edinburgh, compared with London, didn't do badly. And the reason being, again, look at it, it's about income. Edinburgh actually got some quite good capital growth as well. Um, so, so therefore, actually, I think we're beginning to see maybe money going into the regions that we didn't see before because of this income fellowship. So what's been happening in terms of volumes? Well, you can see there that 
remembering that we've had a few shocks to the market in the last few years, it is interesting, isn't it, that actually the volumes have gone up beyond the levels that they were 2005, 6, 7. And that is about asset allocation. It's about money coming into property. But the other thing I'd like to draw your attention to, if you look at the three bottom bars, the traditional asset classes of uh, offices, industrial, and retail, they've been more or less flat within a spread each year. Um, 2016 Brexit year, just as an anomaly for the moment. What has been driving the market is the alternative mixed use, hospitality, leisure, student housing, PRS, self-storage. And that is now taking up 25% of the market. It's challenging offices as the primary asset class. And so we are shifting, if you like, what it is that we're investing in. And again, that's an interesting uh, part of the market because that is actually a local market. It's about demographics. So in other words, what we need to do is to understand what might be happening is actually follow demographics. And again, I'll pick up on that. Scotland, again, <coughs> has got some growth in that area as well, as you can see. The interesting thing about Scotland, though, is that if you remember the slide before, that the pickup, we actually exceeded in terms of total trade in the UK, um, the figures in 2005, 6, 7. We've gone beyond that. What we haven't done is seen that allocation shift in Scotland at the moment, and that might be an issue around confidence as well, but it is beginning to grow. So, money. The thing that's made the most difference to our marketplace is that this is now a global real estate economy. Money is actually coming in from all over the world into Europe. The UK has been the primary destination for that money since we got into a global market. Um, that, again, is something to follow because it is changing. But you can see there that the, the uh, influence of overseas investors into Europe is huge. Mark Carney called it the kindness of strangers. And so we start looking at the kindness of strangers. 50% of our market is down to overseas investors. So if you want to follow the market, you've got to follow them. You've got to ask them what they're doing. That's why pricing perhaps in London has pushed ahead beyond comparison in other regional cities because that has been the focus. The kindness of strangers has been very much focused on London, but as you can see, it is falling. Um, if you look at London, just last year, 92% of all the buyers in central London, over 100 million pounds, were overseas. So you can see when you're building these tower buildings, you've got to ask actually, where is the next wave of these people coming from? Particularly if there are restrictions in China, um, and particularly if there is a worry about what's happening in the UK with Brexit. So, you know, again, values are, and holding up of values is important. If we look at Scotland, overseas investors, the same story. That overseas investment in the real estate market in the UK is massively important. So, in other words, this confidence thing about the UK is something you have to look at in terms of driving values for the future. And one of the things that we've noticed has changed is that the overseas investor it has changed. Global institutional investors, continental institutional investors have been taking up a large amount of the market. If you look to the right-hand side of the bars, this sort of orangey, sort of pale orange uh, color, global other, those are private people. They are in corporations owned by a single or sort of a small group of investors. They are actually now 50% of the London market last year, CC land. Private individuals capable of buying buildings of a billion pounds and over. But they are not people that actually have an asset allocation strategy. They will buy in terms of sat satisfying maybe a longer term objective. They'll arrive in the market and disappear. They won't actually be the sort of people you can go and talk to and say, OK, tell me about your asset allocation strategy. What are you going to do? Because that's not the way that they think, single family offices. And the reason that that's important is that if you look at the range of transactions, the best pricing in markets for the different types of investor, 
you can see there that actually if you have a, a change in sentiment from foreign investments from the Far East, you start changing your yield perspectives. So again, if we're looking at what's happening in the marketplace, you can see there that there is a very interesting differential and margin between where your buyers are coming from. And part of the reason is because a lot of the buyers, again, are looking at the UK um, with, you know, in terms of Brexit. The other thing is the volatility, which you might pick up in banking terms of the UK currency, against the dollar in particular, has increased the cost of hedging. And that actually becomes important in terms of, again, you know, exit pricing. So, if you are actually looking at this in a global perspective then, and actually you start looking at risks, this, the World Economic Forum in Davos does a number of things. If you want to actually look at what people think about risk, there is a world risk report that comes out in advance of that conference. It's worth reading. Because actually, interestingly enough, most of the risks that the, the leaders of the world, the chief executives of the major corporations are worried about, are not about asset pricing or economic circumstances, they're about climate change. So global disasters, terrorism, cyber terrorism, those are the things they're worried about. And actually, mainly you can see that in terms of where they think risks are in the US. Donald Trump didn't appear. But um, on the left-hand side, if you compare that with the UK, there's a very different list of worries. And the reason that that is the case is because it's pretty obvious in terms of what's going on politically here in terms of pricing. And that means that a lot of people are underweight UK in terms of their asset allocations at the moment. So the Bank of England asks the question, are assets getting overvalued? So how do you measure that? Well, let's look at long-term trends and pricing around those long-term trends. They're worried about real estate. They're worried about where real estate yields are going um, and whether or not actually we're getting towards the um, apogee, if you like, of values at the moment. Um, but you can see there that just about every asset class by this measure is overvalued. Um, and this is not... Uh, uh, different in the UK to the rest of the world. You can look at virtually every economy on this measure at the moment and the assets are, are overvalued. And the reason being is if you put $14 trillion, about 40% of the whole market, if you take that out of the market by buying bonds because of quantitative easing, you bring yields down. And there, of course, actually anything that actually can give you income return becomes important. And that's why asset prices and property prices have been going up because of this. So you again then have to start looking about the direction of these long-term indicators and where they're going. At the moment, we seem to be floating around 1.4, 1.5 in the UK, but the pressure is always up until such time as you realize that actually economic performance is not quite where it should be. And that's actually where we start getting into our comparative performance. The worst performing economy of the G7. You know, the, the, the worst performing index of the, the top index is the FTSE 100 against its peers. You know, but basically people are looking at the UK and saying we're not quite sure. We're risk off. We're underweight. We're not going to invest in much in the UK at the moment. And actually, we will look at things that actually protect income over a medium term. We're not going to take short term risk, which is why longer dated rates, longer dated lease terms are of interest. So one of the problems that we have in terms of the economy then, and let's just focus on that for a little bit, is that productivity levels in the UK have not been rising. They've not been rising much in the rest of the world either, but for some reason we have got near full employment but no gains in productivity, which means that we're not generating, if you like, that growth that you need to see. Um, and that's something that we have to focus on, and it's something that governments are focused on, but of course they've got other things also. It's getting this onto the top of the agenda at the moment is quite difficult. Um, and the reason that that's important is this. Let me take you back to demographics. If you really want to understand where to go in the UK at the market at the moment, just look at this chart. It's the only thing you need to know. The population is getting older. We are not filling it in terms of economically active people. And actually, we get so dependency at the higher level of the age group and the lower level of the age group is increasing. So in other words, we've got to get more productivity out of the middle level in order for the econ economy to grow. 
And if you look at this in terms of working age, you can see there that actually the, the simple thing is it's not growing by much, but the, the, the real issue is that you know, there are a lot of people, me, coming up to retirement and uh, uh, perhaps looking, and maybe actually everybody says, well, you know, you seem healthy enough, maybe you should work for longer, so actually the, you spread productivity. But the thing about this is also demand. So look at this in another way, housing. There is a housing shortage in the UK, throughout the UK. How do we deal with that? How do we get more housing in? How, is, how do we make it affordable? Is it right that ownership is the only solution? Should it be rental as well? And if demographics are there and actually housing, generally housing sizes are uh, households are going smaller rather than larger, the type of housing needs to change as well. The stock is not right. So there's a lot to fix in that sector, and that's domestic, and that's domestic growth, and that's why you see the alternative sector becoming far more important in terms of what we are looking at than just the historic classes. So does technology rescue us? Does te te technology make us more productive? The interesting thing is that you know, we resist change. Um, we're using Amazon to buy, and Amazon becomes logistics, and that's affecting retail. But generally speaking, even in the US, where you would have thought take-up of technology is changing their world, only 18% of it so far, we're slow to adapt. Technology will actually take us further if only we would adapt to it. And actually that, adapt, that, that adaptation is actually down to us, it's human beings. But nonetheless, it is something which will change uh, futures, processing and technology. So therefore you start looking at automation. And so another chart which would help you as an asset allocator perhaps is actually where the green is good, by the way, the, the red and the pinks are bad in terms of adopt, adoption of automation. So in other words, you can see here that the things that are affected by automation, those, those economies, are the ones that you have to focus on. It's no wonder that actually bringing investment into the North becomes, and bringing infrastructure into the North becomes a massive part of government policy because you can see the changes that are there. But if you're allocating investment, you would, see, you would also look at this and say, well, actually, which areas are more resilient? And that actually also brings a further problem. If you look at it from an employer's point of view, what are they most bothered about? It's the same thing year after year since uh, we've been doing, even with Andrew in the background there, actually still sitting in the, the naughty seats at the back. Um, you know, when we were doing business parks years ago, actually the number one thing was actually how do I get the right people? It still is. So if the skill sets are moving to the areas where there's economic growth, then that's where the employers are going to go. The interesting thing is that if you look at London at the moment, it's becoming a tech hub because the skill set in investment banking and in finance industries are actually very much about analysts and data. And so therefore that's why you're seeing an awful lot of growth of IT in the city and the city fringes. Other cities that have got the same sort of advantage, Bristol, for instance, Birmingham, I think, probably Edinburgh, um, maybe Glasgow as well, will see some of that advantage creeping in. So this is the thing. I want to go back then to real estate to finish all this off. The level of change of asset allocation globally to real estate has been on the rise. It explains everything in terms of this yield pressure that we've seen. Everybody wants income. Um, and one of the reasons that everybody wants income is because as the population gets older, the investors, the money in the population gets older as well. And the, the, the nature of investor changes. It wants income. Uh, it's been absolutely proven that actually most of the two-thirds of the wealth in North America and Europe is in uh, households with the head of household being of a, an age of 55 or over. Most people at that age bracket want security of return. They don't want to take huge capital risk. And that is another reason why interest rates have kept low. There's a Bank of England, if you want to read these things, a staff reporting paper issued at the end of last year, I think it's um, working paper number 1701, but it's actually gone to a great length to actually prove that people, young, you know, basically the older people of the population are keeping interest rates low um, by about 231 basis points since uh, the 1990s. And that actually is it's set to continue for the future. So <clears throat> while you worry, 
about interest rates, the other side, the investor is still actually looking for income and will continue to actually keep, put some pressure downwards on interest rates. If you look at the target allocations, actually where, do, where does money come from, you'll see there that actually the target allocations from the Asia Pacific Investor Group is still rising towards Europe. So it may not be the Chinese, but just watch the South Koreans, just watch the Japanese over the next 10 years. Watch the Indonesians and the others. Um, you'll find that there's more money. You might even find, actually, that one day it will be North Korea as well. Who knows? Um, but the simple thing is the pressure in the real estate market is still there. It's just at the moment that maybe the pressure is being lifted a little bit from the UK market for traditional assets. Um, and that actually, you go to, I'll let, I'll let the listed actually fight about this one later. But you look at the way in the listed and the NAVs are, are, are basically working. And maybe NAV, I think we were talking about this with Andrew, yeah, and he's probably going to raise it, that actually why are NAVs so important when actually it's all about income. But the interesting thing is if you look at the positive and the negative, you can start seeing that if you like this new retailing investment stock logistics is seen to be towards the positive side, student housing, basically self-storage. And the negative side are the traditional asset classes, even in London, actually with negative asset values. Um, basically, we, I couldn't quite in, into, would be right on the right-hand side there at a, a, a fairly significant, even larger significant discount to asset value. So the market's saying there's something happening there as well, you know, moving to these growth stocks from perhaps the traditional ones. And I just wanted to leave some thoughts which may be picked up on later. So let's look at our marketplace. And so look at actually where the exposure to the marketplace is. The investable market in the UK is about 600 billion. Total real estate stock, commercial real estate stock is just under a billion. But the investable bit, the bit that's circulating around about 600 billion, 38% of that roughly is in retail. And actually, the volumes in retail, as you saw, have been falling. So the liquidity in the retail part of the market is falling. And that becomes an issue because there's a lot of exposure to it. So how do we fix that? One of the things we know, and I'm sure it's going to be picked up by Ben, is the nature. What you have to do as a retail operator changes. You have to start looking at experience. You have to start looking at this trend. And you have to start offering a means to attract people back into city centres to um, your mouths. Um, and that is actually what's happening. People are spending more money on recreation and leisure than they are necessarily spending on goods. And maybe we're move moving from an ownership society to a leasing society where people don't need a car if you're living in an urban centre. You don't need to buy a house if you can rent something that you want to live in. So maybe there's a change going through in terms of what we want, and this is the adaption that we have to take if we're going to actually fix some of the problems that we have in retail. So as a segue for them. So let's just finish in terms of where we are in cycles. The Bank of England look at the, the, the last two recessions, the big recessions we've had, and they blame it on us. It's all our fault. It's all to do with property. First one, we overbuilt because actually the banks lent us load, lent a load of money to speculate. The second one is we overgeared, and so when there was a crash, you know, basically there was a huge problem. So the Bank of England look at this and say, how can I predict what's going on in the future? Well, if you could answer that question, you wouldn't be here anyway. But what they did with the PIA, with the IPF, and lots of other clever people, is started looking at trends in the market, and so they produced a long-term trend. And so they then looked at the pricing movement against that long-term trend year by year, and then looked forward to see what would happen in the next five years against that trend. And what they found is that with the black line going up, if you move forward five years, the red line actually shows you what happened in the market. And so it fits quite neatly, and isn't that great, because all economists like to see a fit, that if you start seeing capital growth going over 20%, then you can expect in the next five years a fall in value of about 35%. So the question is, of course, where are we at the moment? And, of course, we're nowhere near that. So 
yes, we are definitely going to have some impact on the marketplace, but it doesn't appear to be such a calamitous fall as the one we had before. There are other things now affecting us. Um, if you look at it in a more simple way, which is really the way I like looking at it, is if you look at rental value growth and capital growth, they should be aligned. They should be correlated. They should look at, um, you should look at rental value growth actually affecting capital growth because, of course, capital values are just a discounted uh, future value anyway. So looking at those two lines, where they're in sync, you think they're right. When they're rising at a big gradient, you think there's something coming, and you can see that's exactly what happened. If you looked at this chart in 2004, you would have said, oh, I think I need to get out, and you would have been right. You would have saved yourself a lot of um, pain. The same happened in 1988, 89, when we were seeing huge levels of rental growth per annum, and you knew that had to be wrong. And so at the moment you look at this and you say, well, actually, those lines don't appear to be causing me too much concern. If anything, you can see some yield adjustment in uh, because of, if you like, the, the confidence levels that are in the market. We're predicting, by the way, this year we would be about 55 billion against 63 billion last year in total volume. So there are some adjustments going. So what does that mean in terms of outcomes and forecasts. And the one thing I would say is don't believe this because actually the forecasts actually are looking at historic information and trying to actually give you some idea of the future. But everybody wants a forecast, so this is as. And basically what it's saying, go back to where I started, it's all about income. You may get some rental value growth. The one that puzzles me is in retail at the moment, uh, but that's what the uh, lines say. Um, but at the moment, what you can see there is that you've got a pretty low returns coming over the next few years. And that is just simply because there's not, if you like, that driver in the market, which is actually sort of economic growth and rental growth. I suspect, again, these will be wrong. Um, because, as I say, there will always be something else. But actually, the, the simple thing is, if you talk to an institution, you say, well, what am I expecting as a return over the next five years? And they could, you would basically say, I can give you 5 to 6% ungeared. They would say, great. So with the usual health warning, which I now have to give, which is basically everything I've just said, forget I was never here. Um, but uh, I hope that's been a good start for you, Colin. Absolutely. Thank you so much.